Diane Cardwell. I just spent the weekend with you, or not you in person, <laughs> but with your book. I loved it. It's called oh, Rock Away. Yeah, I'm so glad. Surfing headlong into a new life, very well suited for Wisdom Well and our Modern Elder Academy. Welcome to um, our Friday book club uh, as part of Wisdom Well. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And Rockaway is a place I've heard of before. I've never been there. It's sort of like that sort of crazy place at the end of the subway lines. Um, and it was actually in the New York Times this last weekend with a profile mm -hmm. on a hotel that's going there. Is Rockaway getting sort of, you know, bougie and upscale now? <laughs> What's well, like? kind of. I mean, Rockaway has actually always had its bougie upscale end, right? I mean, as far back as when it... Um, you know, the 19th century, there were grand, one of the largest hotels, largest and grandest hotels ever built was built here. Um, it, I think it never opened, it had financial trouble, but, but so there has always been grandeur. There are, you know, wealthy enclaves, but I think what's, what you're seeing now is that there's been so much attention um, and excitement around surfing, around Rockaway, around our recovery after Sandy, that the kind of middle part of the peninsula, which is the, probably the most mixed in terms, you know, it's mm -hmm. got working class, it's got hipsters, it's got upper middle class, it's got, you know, the gamut. Um, and so that is starting to get more kind of upscale hangouts like the Rockaway mm -hmm. Hotel. So. Mm. And you were a hospitality reporter for the New York Times. And so let's be clear also, Rockaway is in New York City. It's in yes. Queens yes. On, the, on the edge of Long Island. Um, yes. And you were a hospitality reporter for the New York Times. I was. So for a, for a brief and shining moment, um, my job was to write about bars, hotels, and restaurants, which meant that I had to spend time in bars, hotels, and restaurants, which obviously right now seems like a lifetime ago that um, once we all lived that, that way all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I did have a hospitality beat for a while and you know, also covered politics real estate, the borough of Brooklyn, mm. alternative energy. I even read a little bit about surfing here and there for the time. So, so let's to get into the surfing piece because you were at sort of a low point in your life. And part of the reason I was so fascinated by this book is not just the surfing element because a lot of our um, compadres who come to Modern Elder Academy they learn how to surf um, at the end of their week. But it was also the fact that you were at age 45 struggling. You had hit a low. And interestingly yeah. enough, the U-curve of happiness they talk about in social science is 45 to 50, a really rough period. <laughs> and in your prologue, you say the following, you write the following, I needed this break from the rest of my life, which felt in shambles. Over the past five years, I've been lashed by loss after loss, my marriage, my father, my chances of bearing a child. I was in every sense of the word adrift. Surfing, despite my distinct lack of aptitude and struggles to find my balance in the ocean, consistently brought me joy and a sense of purpose. On a surfboard, I could feel powerful and free and in tune with the universe, if only for an instant. The rest of the time, I felt the opposite. Give us a little more background on that. So I had had a very, very, very rough period. Um, you know, my marriage had fallen apart. Um, I had afterwards tried to get pregnant on my own and couldn't. Um, and I just had gone through this period of feeling like, and then also my, my father died. And um, I went through this period of feeling like my life was never, ever, ever going to be happy again, right? I was just never going to, you know, have again what I felt I had lost, which was this kind of wonderful looking life that really wasn't as fulfilling and satisfying as it looked, but it was what I had thought I wanted and what I thought was so important to me. Um, you know, the brownstone and the handsome husband and the fabulous job. And, you know, all of those things are nice to have, but they were not making me like so excited to get up every morning and like go out there and do this thing. And surfing did. It was, and it was so strange um, because I never thought of myself as athletic. I was terrible at it once I started, but I just loved the feeling of it and the presentness and the being in the ocean and all of that that you get. Um, and so what I knew is that I should keep trying to do that. And everything kind of flowed from 
that. And the other thing is right at that moment that I was writing, I had also been through Sandy because, you know, the joy of surfing led me to move to Rockaway and try to get better, even though I, I mean, I, I'm still a terrible surfer, but, um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> but, um, but anyway, but I did find that just focusing on this one little thing that I knew made me happy, kind of everything else eventually fell into place around that. So you, one of the passages in the book, you said, uh, you write, I realized if I wanted to surf, I would need to unlearn my father's lesson. Failure would have to be an option again and again and again. So talk about that. What's it like to be in midlife and realizing that some of the mindsets that you've carried with you, the voices, the identities aren't serving you anymore and you actually have to let go of them. Right. Well, that's, that was the hardest, but also the most rewarding part of the journey in a way. And it's one reason that I wanted to write the book is because I thought other people might be able to see themselves in that. Um, you know, I think we tell each ourselves a lot of things about what we can do, who we are, we put labels, and then those labels becomes boxes that you get stuck in. Um, and so I just knew that what I had been doing was not working. And that this thing, which, you know, would require a rethinking, because not only did I have to fail, I had to fail in public. I had to fail in <laughs> front of people constantly. And, you know, I, I, I was lucky that I fell in with a very supportive, enthusiastic group. And that, that is one thing that I would say that this kind of, you know, transformation is one you can't really tackle it like a transformation, right? It's like, I didn't go in saying, I am going to transform my life and make myself happy now. I'm gonna unlearn these lessons, and, right? It's like, you, it's one step at a time. Um, but the other thing is you can't do it alone. Like you need the community of other people who are invested and engaged in the same kind of project that you are um, to be, to be um, sort of to get as much out of it as you might. So let's talk, which I totally agree with you. And this is part of the, the value of MEA is how a group of people for 18 people come together for a week and create this, you know, strange social, social crucible where they actually realize they can be vulnerable together and, and they can fail together. <laughs> um, so let's talk about uh, your friend Murat. Um, Murat. You, you, Murat and you created sort of an accountability partnership because um, for 30 days, because in some ways you had an excuse every morning about why you were not getting in the water. Now, I know about this as someone who's a novice surfer down in Baja, right? You know, our, we have waves just about a five to 10 minute drive away from us. Um, I make so many darn excuses about why I shouldn't surf each day. And so talk a little bit about that, all the excuses and then how that accountability partner I, I, what, how, what that did for you, but also what you did for him as well. Right. Well, it's true. So, so this is a lifelong battle, right? We all, we're always going to make excuses for why we can't do something. And you, you just got to keep fighting that every step of the way. But what happened for me in this was Marat, just simply, we, you know, we struck this bargain. We will, he was going to try to write. I was going to try to surf every day for a month and we would see what happened and we would report to each other. And you didn't have to like write up a big report. You just had to send an email that said surfed, wrote. And, you know, sometimes we'd say more, sometimes, you know, I mean, we never, we never shirked the reporting. Mm -hmm. And so, but the reporting did kind of make me feel accountable. And in the end, I began to see simply how much how a simple shift in thinking. So I was no longer thinking if I was going to surf, I was thinking when I was going to surf. Mm -hmm. And so that meant I organized my whole day around when was I going to get in the water. And if I didn't feel like I could do anything, I had to, I had to figure something out. So if it was too flat, which was a reason to stay out, mm -hmm. I would find something to do like a paddling drill. Or if it was too big, I would find a place on the inside where I could practice something. And so just with that consistent, like putting the effort to surf first every day, I got better. 
I hope everybody noticed uh, a little bit of lingo that we heard from Diane there. She said on the inside. She did not know what <laughs> on the inside was 10 no. years ago. <laughs> that is true. A girlfriend, let's talk about this. You're a, you're a, you were older than most people there. You're a woman and you're a person of color. Mm -hmm. Were you welcomed with open arms? Did you ever have any self-consciousness about that? Um, and, you know, was that, that was that a, a, badge of of courage or was it just a sense like you know it didn't matter well to, for me personally it didn't really matter um the sort of the age the age the race the gender didn't really matter because i've, I've lived much of my life that way right i've, I've in my jobs what all right I've, I've been in mainstream publishing for a long time that is not a, that is not you know you just don't mm -hmm. see that many people of color at least you didn't used to you see, mm -hmm. see more now I think and that's actually true of surfing in Rockaway it's far more integrated um, than it was but you know what was interesting is I wasn't the oldest right there so there mm -hmm. are a lot of older surfers out here in Rockaway I mean Rockaway is it's an urban it's a working class urban neighborhood and therefore an urban surf break and so you get you know, these old dudes who can rip and who are incredibly welcoming. And so that eased my way in as well. But, um, but I would say it, it is nice now that I see other black women, especially in the water and, um, and also just other surfers of color than I did when I first started. Um. There were five lessons I got from your experience in surfing. These are the things that I think you learned. I'm just gonna mention them and then mm -hmm. you're welcome to riff on any of them. Um, you came face to face with freedom. That was like, there's a sense of like the freedom you had, like just to, to try something new. Mm -hmm. um, you built a tribe and a sense of community, which seems like one of the more profound things that ex you experienced. You had a sense of purpose each day that, was, that brought you I, I, the fourth thing, feeling alive. You felt more alive than you'd felt in a long time. And then you were learning how to break habits in this whole process. So um, anything, anything you want to summarize on any of that? Right. Well, I, I would say that all those things are true. Um, the thing that always comes to mind for me, though, when I, when I think about um, this whole, like sort of the whole journey and the big lesson is there's a moment in the book where a friend, um, this woman who I've just met at... Um, a women's surf film workshop says she tells me that she has met her you know she met her husband through surfing and they live with three with five cats on the other side of the bay and what have you and um and and i was saying oh my god that's so amazing that you've built you, this whole life through this you know avocation and she said really intensely it's what i always always believed do what you love and everything else will fall into place and I think that that is a very good thing to keep in mind, that if, you, that if you pursue what you love, you will attract people into your life who love that thing too, and you will automatically have the beginnings of a community. And with that, you can go many, many places. And so I just, that to me, like everything stems around from this kind of pursuit of this thing that I love, which forced me to be more honest about my own bad habits, about where I was, you know, sort of lying to myself about, and also like some things that I had to just shed, right? I had to just shed the idea that I will ever be a great surfer, but I should keep doing it because I love it and it brings me joy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've learned in Spanish is that when I'm having fun, in the process of it, it's so much easier to learn. Right. When I, it, right. It, it, you just, you, you lighten up on yourself. Mm -hmm. and it, it, mm -hmm. I, yes. this, is, this is what I read in the book. If I had an observation, it was mm -hmm. during the course of my reading the 250 pages of this book, I saw this woman blossom. And I mm -hmm. saw you, Thank I you. just saw you, that Anais Nin, that, that, that famous quote about, you know, it, it took more energy to keep the, the, the bud of the blossom mm -hmm. closed as opposed right. to opening. Right. Um, I'd love to have you read a couple of passages mm -hmm. on pages 247 and 252 toward the end of the book. Okay. Um, at, at, basically at the end of the book. Um, let's start with the first one, 247, and just go ahead and read it to us and then okay. I'll ask you a question. Okay. Um, 
It was part of what I was absorbing from Rockaway, a place where a lot of people constructed their lives around their happiness, much as I had constructed a month around surfing, rather than trying to shoehorn a little happiness in between all the obligations. I wanted to try letting things unfold simply as they would. I was learning how to stop looking beyond the horizon, to stay aware of what was around me, focus on what I could make of it, tap into the energy of the moment, hang on and relish the ride. Woo! Girlfriend, are you sure you're a New Yorker? That's a, <laughs> it's like, this is, this is the, New York is the state of shock and California is the state of being. I That's, know. That is I know. quite a state of being. I know. Well, you know, you spend enough time in the ocean and you start to feel the cosmos, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does connect you to these, you know, eternal rhythms of the sun and the moon and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so yeah, we, I think all surfers have a little California woo-woo in them. Yes, <laughs> And more power to us. <laughs> Let's go to page 252 if okay. you don't mind. This is the yeah. very last paragraph of the book. This is the oh. epilogue, and this is how it ends. All right. But that feeling wasn't just about the wave or any of the several I caught that afternoon as I paddled among people I could truly count as part of my tribe. It was also about having escaped a life that looked so good from the outside, but was the product of so many choices I'd made when I was spurred by notions about achievement and happiness and making it that were in the end so wrong for me and left me feeling not successful or satisfied, but anxious and unfulfilled. I had finally got outside of all that here in Rockaway of all places, and I never wanted to go back in. How does it feel to read that? So I just, you know, it still gives me chills um, in part because those are the last words of the book and it means that I really did finish it, which <laughs> is, is kind, I mean, which is just such, to me, feels like such a monumental mountain to have, to have crested. Um, but also I still feel that way, you know, I still feel so grateful to have been able to break out of that box that I'd convinced myself I belonged in and that I think is really hard sometimes for people to get themselves out of. But I think part, cause you can't you sort of, it's, I, I said this a little, I feel like you can't sort of set, like I'm going to break myself out of my box, right? It's like, you have to, I think it has to come through something that may not be as big as remaking my life, but you may end up remaking it in the process. And you did. And yeah. Your romantic life, which had been shut down for a long time, mm -hmm. got interesting. So let's talk. You had a lover, an Italian lover, 15 years younger than you, named Giorgio. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, my God. You talk about it. Like, oh, that was, that that was, was pretty great. Oh my God, but most that was important. really great. It was, it showed you were, you really know, great. you you still had it, girlfriend. Right, you right, know, right. You, you got right. a groove, got a groove. Right, right. No, I, I, I do, I did feel that very much like, oh my God, I'm in middle school and there's a cute guy and he likes me. Oh, I'm gonna have sex again. <laughs> <laughs> and then you meet Todd, who you now live with. And I live with. And the relationship you had always maybe wanted, but felt like was outside of your grasp, right. all right. became part of this circle right. of love with right. your community and with your, your, your friends and with your surfing and with the work that you're doing. And, mm -hmm. and the man showed up, Todd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think you should rename this book, but I'm going to tell you, <laughs> tell us about Todd for a moment. Todd away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, so he's, he's great. I adore him. We're still totally happy living together um, with our little grumpy rescue cat. And um, that, you know, we met online. I did not have, but again, like I didn't go into it thinking, I'm going to find the love of my life now, or I'm going to find like the guy who's really going to make everything, pull everything together. I just thought, I want things to change. I want it to change. I want, I want thing, my romantic life to be different. So I'm going to do something to try to make it different and we'll see what happens. And once and, again, you just yeah. took one step at a time. One step at a time. And had a good attitude about it. Yeah. 
the the book is Rockaway Surviving Headlong into a New Life. I think it could be called Eat, Pray, Surf. <laughs> I love it. It's you know love it. <laughs> it, Eat, Pray, Surf. I think so. It's a spectacular book. It is our Thank Friday you. book club. Diane, I can't wait to meet you in person one of these days. Get you down to Baja, surf That'd together. Um, and thank you. I'd love that. Thank you.